update on the Supreme Court case. This happened a couple of days ago, but we wanted to pair it uh, with some of the more le latest legal Trump developments. There have been some major things happening, but the major headline really from the last few days was the Supreme Court really, de de how do you say this? Defenestrating? De defenestrating? Defenestrating. Defenestrating the uh, Colorado Secretary of State and their legal team who were trying to block Donald Trump's name from the ballot. We have a mashup here of bipartisan justices to really just skewer um, their defense of the law for the interpretation that they tried. Here's what they had to say. I think the reason it's been dormant is because there's been a settled understanding that Chief Justice Chase, even if not right in every detail, was essentially right in the branches of the government have acted under that settled understanding for 155 years. And Congress can change that. And Congress does have Section 2383, of course, the Insurrection Act uh, criminal statute, but Congress could change it, but they have not in 155 years in relevant respects for what you want here today, at least. No, Justice Kavanaugh. The reason why it's been dormant is because by 1876, essentially all former Confederates had received amnesty, and we haven't seen anything like an insurrection since then. Would anything compel a, a lower official to obey an order from, in your view, the former president? I'm imagining a situation where, for example, a former president was, you know, a, a president was elected and they were 25 and they were ineligible to no, hold office, but no, nevertheless they were no, put into that no, office. No, we're talking about section three. And please don't change the hypothetical, okay? I'm, please don't change the hypothetical. I know I like doing it too, but please don't do it, okay? Well, now, the, the point I'm trying to make is He's that, disqualified from the moment he committed an insurrection. Whoever it is, wh whichever party, it, that, that happens. Boom, it happened. What would compel, and I'm not going to say it again, so just try and answer the question. If you don't have an answer, fair enough, we'll move on. And I read your opening brief to accept uh, that those events counted as an insurrection, um, but then your reply seemed to suggest that they were not. So wh what is your position oh, as to that? We, we never accepted or conceded in our opening brief that this was an insurrection. What we said in our opening brief was President Trump did not engage in any act that can plausibly be characterized as insurrection. All right, so because why would not this not engage. be an insurrection? What is your argument that it's not? Your reply brief says that it wasn't because I think you say um, it did not involve an organized attempt to overthrow right. the government. So That's one of many reasons. But for an insurrection, there needs to be an organized, concerted effort to overthrow the government of the United States through violence. And this and so the point occurred. is that a chaotic effort to overthrow the government is not an insurrection? No, we didn't concede that it's an effort to overthrow the government either, Justice Jackson. Right? None of these criteria were met. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. So what we included there at the end was actually Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, who was speaking against the Trump people. Now, if you know, listen, in terms of our legal analysis, we're not lawyers and Supreme Court law is like a whole other one. One of the comments I found no most noteworthy was from Neil Katyal. Uh, you've, I think you've done a monologue on him before, Crystal. Uh, this is like a dyed in the wool, uh, like a you know classic MSNBC, Russia Gate type Democrat, but uh, he's one of those, lots of corporate connections, et cetera. But yeah. MSNBC relies on him for legal analysis which is fair because he's actually argued quite a few cases before the Supreme Court. Here was On behalf of like really terrible yes. outfits. But here was his assessment um, of the Colorado case and their defense before the court. I've watched over 400 Supreme Court arguments. I've done 50 myself. I would tell you this argument did not go well for the Trump challengers. And that's to put it mildly. I probably have some other adjectives that I won't um, say on air. There you have it. Uh, didn't go so well, and people are expecting either it could be 9-0 or a possibly 8-1, depending on how Katanji John Braxton uh, Soto so or Sonia Sotomayor end up ruling in this case. Any reaction, Crystal, before we move on to the next legal development? I mean, it's not surprising right. whatsoever um, because it was, an, you know, it's a sort of unprecedented situation, aggressive reading of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. There were other uh, states in the country that went in the opposite direction of what Colorado did. And the Supreme Court is fundamentally, and I don't mean this on like the typical political spectrum, but just as like a descriptor, it's mm. a fundamentally conservative body that is loath and sort of cowardly, but loath to really like, you know, insert themselves in the political process in this way. Now, in a lot of ways, that's gonna be sort of unavoidable as we're about to discuss 
They are going to have to decide whether they're going to take up an appeal from Trump with regards to whether he should have blanket immunity for basically anything that he did in the context of the presidency. They're going to have to decide whether to let the appeals court ruling on that stand or take that up. There are going to be possibly a number of other things that come before them. So they are going to be central to this election, whether they want to or not. And obviously, not going in the direction of Colorado is also a decision and also consequential. But uh, this is not surprising. This is yes. what everybody was effectively predicting from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, just it was such a novel interpretation, quote unquote. And it was it's just one of those where it obviously jumped the gun too, especially because it was prior to a trial. But that gets us to the real part. And this is where the Supreme Court case could be a lot more interesting and actually could very much turn on Trump. Let's put this next one up on the screen. Donald Trump actually asked the Supreme Court late last night to pause the ruling that was denying him, quote, absolute immunity. And so this is a little bit complicated, but basically there was a previous appeal in which the president said that the election interference trial uh, which is currently trying to have a court date and all of that set. One of the challenges that Trump and his team issued in uh, the appeals court, the DC Court of Appeals, was that was that was subsequently rejected, was that the president has, quote, absolute immunity from criminal prosecution from while he is president. According to them, quote, without immunity from cr criminal prosecution, the presidency as we know it will cease to exist. These were according to the Trump lawyers. Like I said, this has been rejected now by two subsequent appeals courts. Noteworthy though that these appeals courts are far more uh, liberal, I guess, in terms of their appointments. I'm not making a partisan judgment or even really, a, frankly, a judgment on the case itself, but more so just setting it up for what the Supreme Court is now going to have to consider. He has now, by asking the court to have this consideration, it will then trigger the process on their part of whether they're going to accept the case or not. If they don't accept the case, then it will default, Crystal, to the lower court of appeals as opposed to having something that they would rule on. And now, whether they take it, uh, as I said, is up to it's up to the court on which of the three justices, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh, as of how to uh, whether they will take the court, they will take that case before them. Apparently, just in terms of the way uh, that the swing votes and all of that currently lie, but it's one of those where I'm actually not really. Outside of Kavanaugh and Alito, who I believe have more of an interpretation on executive power, this is even the type of thing where Clarence Thomas, who there's a major case going on right now about administrative law, he's more libertarian than others. I would not expect them, at least according to the people I've spoken to, FedSoc, others, that this would be a case that Trump is going to win, yeah. even if it did get accepted by the court. And they may just punt and not take it, because That's that was probably the easiest political course for them as well. Especially because— the appeals court ruling was quite clear. Yeah, it was just and like, was that's not- Quite aggressive. It's just not how it works. And even, you know, it's uh, the appeals court panel, it was three judges, two Democratic appointees, one Republican appointee. It was unanimous. Um, we played, if you guys will recall, a little bit of the oral arguments where they were pretty scathing. They mm -hmm. were basically like, oh, so the president right, the could SEAL just team like- six, exactly. Yeah, can yeah. direct the SEAL Team 6 to murder his political rival. And then effectively, if he resigns before he's impeached, he can just get away with that. They, mm -hmm. they were highly scathing and skeptical of this. Obviously, they ruled against the Trump team. I think this is one of these where the Trump team didn't really expect to succeed, but this is part of their stra strategy of drawing this out as much as possible. And so, so, you know, the outcome at the Supreme Court is uncertain. I think it's unlikely to go in Trump's direction. But probably the bigger question is just how long do they take to make a decision here? The trial for this case, this is kind of the central one. This is the election sub subversion one, Jack Smith in D.C. Yep. It's, you know, the center of like what happened in 2020 and stop the steal and all of that stuff. That's this case. So it's really the one that is most central to the concerns that so many Americans have about Donald Trump and the disgust that they felt for what they watched unfold on January 6th and also leading up to January 6th. So in a lot of ways, this case is kind of the main event, whether or not it is the most likely to succeed is a different question. So in any case, this was originally scheduled to begin on March 4th. So we were very close on the precipice of this bad boy starting up and, you know, mm. really taking over news coverage and being the center of our sort of political universe. And at a very early date in which, you know, it was very, very likely that this would be concluded even before you get to the, the RNC. That original date has been taken off the schedule while this appeals process plays out. 
And as Sagar was indicating, you know, there are a bunch of different options. Number one, a Supreme Court could just say, no, we're not, the appeals court ruling stands, we're not taking it up, you can proceed, and then that's that, and you would think that the trial would then commence probably pretty shortly. They could take it up in an expedited process, so they consider the appeal, but they do it on a more timely fashion, or they could do it in their sort of like ordinary course of what their normal schedule is, which of course is what the Trump team is pushing for, in which case you would not have this trial then starting till, you know, late in the general election process, most likely. So the stakes here in terms of whether the Supreme Court even decides to take up the appeal are pretty significant, separate and apart from what they ultimately end up deciding, which, like I said, I think most legal observers feel like this is not going to go in Donald Trump's direction. It's more important for what the timing is and how much he's able to delay before this trial actually begins. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's all very well said. And as we come back to it, uh, just wanted to continue to highlight for people that there are still more cases that are not even at the Supreme Court level, which could be consequential for Trump. Two, actually, this week, let's put this up there on the screen, two cases, two judges, as they highlight, we're facing a potential ruling in that civil fraud case that we've talked about previously, which cost Trump hundreds of millions of dollars, which on top of the E. Jean Carroll verdict could be very consequential to him personally. And as we said, he could also receive that court date um, on his actual trial for the first criminal trial of the former U.S. president. This one would go back to... Um, this one would go back to some of the New York instances. This is the Stormy we, Daniels, the Stormy Daniels Money situation. Alvin Bragg situation, which we have all laid out. So I know it can be tedious to try and go through the arguments and all this, but it's just so consequential, Crystal, to the ability, literally his ability to run. Because let's say he is convicted, you know, on January 6th, the elected, that election interference trial. Well, we may have to go through an entire recycle of the Colorado ballot access thing, where we'd have a new interpretation where they're like, well, now he's been convicted of this. And even though it's not technically an insurrection, we may have to have the appeals court process. We have the Supreme Court that I have to weigh in again. And then same whenever it comes to his money, his literal ability to fund his life and you know his uh, legal bills and whether he'd have to ask his supporters and then coming back to the criminal prosecution in the state of New York and what the actual impact of that would have for him, mm. uh, not just for his business, his ability to appear on the ballot in the future. Not like he needs New York or you know, it's not like he's going to win the state of New York or anyway, but the point is, is that that then links back to a little Georgia case, which we haven't even added in here with all the developments of Fannie Willis. So it's, it's a huge mess. Yeah. And it's actually a there's mess. a hearing in Georgia this week yeah, presenting right. evidence to a judge about the romantic relationship that Fannie Willis was right. having with the dude that she appointed. So that's a whole other situation. But just to go back to these two New York cases and their significance, on the civil fraud piece, this could be a lot of money. Even yeah. for someone as incredibly wealthy as Donald Trump, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, that's a lot of money. So um, that one is significant just in terms of his personal wealth, business status. He may be barred from doing business in the state of New York. That's where some of his most iconic properties are around which the Trump brand has mm -hmm. been built. So that's significant from that perspective. The other one, the Alvin Bragg one, I mean, this is seen as sort of like the stepchild, the least significant of the criminal charges against Donald Trump. And this is where the delay on the uh, the immunity question that we were just talking about with regards to the actual election subversion case, this is where this becomes really significant. Because if it weren't for that delay, that would have been the case that went first, which again is the one that is much more central to people's concerns about Donald Trump. So even for him to have the timing be that the Alvin Bragg case starts first, and that's Americans' first taste of you know Trump on trial, that's sort of the the narrative that sets in. I know it's a much easier case for him to make that that one is you know politically charged and these are old allegations and it's a witch hunt, et cetera, than it is to make that same charge against the um, election subversion case, which again, many Americans have deep concerns about. So I think it is a tactical win for him that the Alvin Bragg case is the first one to launch here. Most likely that's the first one where the trial date is gonna be the earliest and where we're hearing evidence and all of those things. So um, in any case, it's still a real guessing game how the timing on all of these things is going to play out, but this is what we know at this point to the best of our ability. Yeah, I think you are very right in raising that. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.